Good morning, church. It's good to see you all this morning. This is a beautiful day. I got to say, I love the fall in the desert. It is the best. Cool in the morning, warms up just enough to warm up, and then cools right back off. It is the best. Can we open with, with prayer this morning? Lord Jesus, thank you for the time we get to come together as your people, called out by your name to be a part of what you are doing here in this city. Lord, today, would you work in our hearts and in our minds? Lord Jesus, would you renew us? And may the Holy Spirit be in the presence and the praise of your people. Be glorified this morning, Lord Jesus, as we come to you. Teach us and renew us today. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen and amen. Just a couple of announcements uh, coming up in a, just a couple of weeks. There is a Saturday that we take to decorate the church for Christmas. It's really a fun Saturday morning. We'll get up, we'll get here about 10 o'clock. It takes about two hours. Uh, we'll have some pastries and coffee, and we'll just kind of deck, uh, deck the hall for Christmas, if you will. So it, it's just a lot of fun. It's the Saturday right after Thanksgiving. We'll be here at 10 o'clock to decorate for Christmas. It's a lot of fun. So I invite you to come and be with us that weekend. That is also the first weekend of Advent. So as we enter into the expectation of the return of Jesus, that's the first four weeks before Christmas is called Advent. And we want you to celebrate with us. So make room on the calendar. Make room online to, to make sure you celebrate uh, Advent season with us. I'm going to invite Russell Sperling up to the podium. He's going to read our scriptures this morning. As always, you can always give online through the... You get applause, dude. What? <laughs> we got to remember that. Russell's good. He'll get, he'll get applause. So we're going to go with that. As usual, you can give in the foyer on the giving machine. Of course, cash and check in the boxes. Online, you can give through our app or through the, uh, the website uh, with PushPay. You just go onto the website, 29church.org, and you can give. We truly appreciate you giving faithfully uh, to the Lord and through this church. So thank you all so very much for your faithfulness. Russell, would you take us to the Lord this morning? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, church. Today we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, sustainer and giver of all good things, would you be honored in our giving today? Thank you for being the one who brings us the provision we need for each and every day. Today, be our guide as we give you our time, talent, and treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. So let's take a few moments as the, as the music team gets up to the front. Uh, let's welcome one another in the name of the Lord. That means handshakes. That means hugs. That means uh, however you greet one another. I 
are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is that I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Who can wipe away the tears of broken dreams and wasted years? And tell the past to disappear. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you go. Going on to if you could, who can work it out for your good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is that I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh, oh, oh. he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can say let me tell you about I'm a Christian. I'm whispering I was lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. I'm confessing that I stumble and I need Christ to be my guide. I'm professing that I'm weak and I need his strength to carry on. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now that you have given us this opportunity to come before you and to come worship together in this place. Father God, we are all sinners, Father God, and we know that only through you, you are going to be able to cleanse us and save us. Father God, we lay it all down and we give all of our burdens to you. Father God, today we just ask that you continue to love us. Keep your guidance and your grace over us, Father God. Continue to give us mercy throughout our sins, throughout our mistakes, Father God. We worship you today, Father God. Be with us as we, as we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Very tired. 
time I tried to make it all mine. And the time I tried to stand and start to fall. All those lonely roads that I have traveled on. There was Jesus. And the life I built came crashing to the Friends I had were nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing fed.
It's the only reason I'm here. Oh, man. God, I give you what I can today. These scattered ashes that I hid away, I lay it all at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn your name. Show me the love. I say I believe. Help me to lay it down. Oh Lord, I lay it down. Jesus, 
We are your people. And we want to lay our dreams, our desires, our imperfections down at your feet and allow you to recreate us, to make us more like yourself, Lord, so that those that know us the best see the most of Jesus in everything that we do and everything that we say. Lord, help us to grow to be people of integrity, of encouragement, of joy and generosity and kindness and of a consistent reminder of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Bring glory to that name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for joining this morning. Thank you, worship team. Very beautiful. And um, today, for what it's worth, uh, I was absolutely clueless that you were playing in one key or they were in, I think they were all in the wrong key. And Well, <laughs> I say that one. I sincerely did not know a notice a thing about that. So, um, but we have to be humble enough to admit our shortcomings and so forth, and to grow and to improve. And so, uh, I'm thankful for this team. The joy, the heart, the service is what makes it worthwhile. So, um, the Lord didn't gift me with musical ability, but He gifted me with the ability to appreciate the heart of people that are serving together to honor our Lord. So. Um, for me, it was a beautiful experience, and it continues to be, because we are the people of God. I'm going to ask you to join with me in the second book of Peter, chapter 3. We're going to be sharing from verses 1 through 10. Um, and it begins by saying in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Oh, by the way, we Americans, we don't like the word command, by the way. I've noticed that. Just a little sidelight. Going on with verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you in the, that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by that same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire, they, have, they are being kept for the day of judgment when un, ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as a, unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to be or found to deserve judgment. When I look through this uh, passage, there's several different topics that come to mind. You could go a few different directions. There's definitely a lot about the end at times and the severity of it some hints of the things that are referred to in the book of Revelation and in uh, the end of the book of uh, Daniel. There's definitely some things that are talked about there, but that isn't what jumped out at me in looking at this passage uh, over the last couple of weeks. What got my attention is how this uh, passage begins. Um, Peter is taking the time to bring reminders and encouragement. One thing that he understood is that his life here as a human was nearing an end. He had walked with Jesus for three and a half years, been close friends with him. Following the resurrection, he was uh, appointed to be one of the strong leaders of the church. He had done much and said much, won many souls to the kingdom. But he wanted his final days to really count. And so he uh, was pouring out his heart here. Um, Pastor John had the great privilege last week of sharing uh, some of the harsh, harsh messages that uh, Peter had to share uh, regarding some false teachers that were out there. Not everybody at the close of their days is 
going to be received well by the Lord. These people, by their deliberate behavior and their deliberate false teaching, had stored up a lot of trouble for themselves. But we don't need to focus on that. Our job is to focus on the message that the Lord has given to us. Those that have uh, deliberately chosen to go their own way, they're going to experience what God has for them, and it won't be pretty. But what are we supposed to do? We're the people of God. We're the ones that have uh, turned to Him, received the forgiveness. We talked in that song about the, uh, the riz- or I guess probably the second song, about the empty tomb that He rose up out of. We have a glorious risen Savior who's given us a new life. We are those people, and we're going to take a look at that. So I'm going to reread uh, verses 1 and 2 first. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And I like the heart of Peter. He's talking to dear friends because he does love these people. And in both of them, I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. When I look at this, the first thing that I see is that it's his second letter. The first letter he had written to the people, it had accomplished uh, what he sought for at that time. But now there's an urgency that in Peter's heart that this is his last chance to really share, what did he want to share? Encouragement with the people, it says here. I want to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. He's not trying to threaten the folks or scare them. He's trying to encourage them. He's got the heart of God towards these people. He even called them dear friends. But he's, that uh, he wanted to turn them back and to remind them. He wasn't trying to give them brand new inspiration that he had just thought up, a new revelation or anything like that. He was pointing them back to some of the basics. He was reminding them to you know, get back to what matters the most. And... Uh, he also brought out something here. He's, he's referenced to what the prophets had said long ago and what Jesus had uh, come to institute and what was being carried out through the uh, Holy Spirit and the Lord's apostles. There is a consistency to the message of God. And Peter was referencing that here. He's saying that we didn't come up with something novel. We didn't come up with a new idea. It's the same idea that has existed from the beginning of creation, that we are God's people designed by him with free will, but that we can use that free will to serve him and to honor him and to bring his blessing into our lives and to other lives through us. He's reminding them of that. That message is throughout all scripture. One of the things that I'm very mindful of there um, is something that Jesus said. He talked about what's the, you know, he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, and this fulfills all that is written in Moses and in the prophets. All of the teaching of God is consistent. It's one heart because it comes from God's heart. He wants us to be thankful and grateful people and to love the people around us. Honor God, love people. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Not always easy to do. And we're going, to come, we're going to circle back around that as, uh, as the Lord gave me for, as we're going to conclude our time today, we're going to come back to that, that loving people. It's not always easy. But there's a consistency to the message. It's not something novel or creative or new. It's the heart of God. He created us, why? Because He loves us. He gave us an example of that in the Garden of Eden. What happened with Adam and Eve? They walked with God side by side in the cool of the day. And as Pastor John shared this morning, we're loving the cool of the day here in the desert. You know, even the, in the beautiful afternoons, I mean, this is good living. Um, but they walked side by side with God, experiencing an open fellowship with Him. That tells me that's what He designed us for, to walk openly and uh, with Him, to be refreshed and enjoying each other's company. That's His heart towards us. We've messed it up, but He wants to bring us back to that going to go forward a little bit further with uh, verses 3 and 4. Most importantly, now he's saying this, but he's going to come up to other things too though, because the uh, theme I came up with for today was always remember and don't ever forget. Um, He's just, he's throwing out singers and I have on occasion in my conversations spoken like this, like, and here's your number one priority, 
And then a few minutes later, and here's your number one priority, and this is the most important thing. You know, it's like each one is like, okay, we've got about six or seven most important things. I kind of feel a little bit that that's what Peter is doing here too. So just uh, pointing that out. Verse 3 says, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. These scoffers, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be mocking and ridiculing the faith of others. I'm certain you've received that same kind of treatment, because I know that I have in my life, where people, they won't say that uh, we're wrong, but they'll make fun of it. Oh, you're a holy goody two-shoes, or how can you believe that junk? It's just in a book. You know, there's a lot of reasons that people will bring forth of why our faith is not founded on something wholesome, making fun of it. They won't deny it. And one thing that I've come to, come to learn about the Lord, that when there's a difference of opinion regarding what the Bible says, I really try to stick with the, directly with the things that Jesus said. People I know that want to debate the Bible, they don't want to argue with any of the words that are, at least in mine, in red. Um, they don't want to argue with what he said. They'll argue with Paul, they'll argue with Peter, but they don't want to argue with the heart and the person of Jesus. There is in most every heart, I won't say all, but most people's hearts, there is a reverence and a respect for the Lord Jesus Christ that stops them short of that kind of you know, open rebellion, but they'll make fun of it. And you know, how come you're doing that? Or they'll say that, you know, you go to church, all they want is your money. You know, they'll be making fun and ridiculing. But what do they do with that? The purpose that Peter brings out here is that when they're making fun and ridiculing, it's so that they have the liberty to follow their own selfish desires. It becomes an excuse. If I, if I belittle a person's faith, then I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want because it just throws off all restraint. That's not the heart of God. He gives us free will. He gives us liberty. But he asks us then to surrender that to him, to use our free will, our liberty, our time, our talents, our treasures for his uh, blessing and his purposes. And he promises that he will bless us through that, especially when it comes to finances. He says, bring the whole tithe in. Give that tenth to me, that you know, one-tenth out of everything that you get. Give it to me and see if I don't bless you in, in return to such a degree that you'll never miss what you've given to me. I know that I've tried that in my own life thinking there is no way and have experienced that kind of blessing. I know others that have done the same thing or you know, at the last minute seen a blessing pour in, a car payment uh, that they just didn't have the money for. Then somebody you know, hands them, you know, it's like, here, um, you know, the Lord impressed on me, you need this right now. Um, I've seen missionaries that provided for in great ways. Um, the Lord works in that when we trust him. Um, people make fun of that. They very seriously do, and it's not enjoyable to be on the receiving end of that. But again, it's, what's the heart behind it? It's to justify selfishness. Um, it goes on in verse 4, it talks about that, you know, one of the, one of the challenges people will give is that you know, you talk about Jesus is supposed to be coming back. Because um, Jesus, it says that uh, when he was raised up to he into heaven, he said, the uh, angel said he's going to come back in a similar fashion and receive a people to himself. We look forward to that. We believe that he's coming back soon. There's nothing else in all of history that needs to happen before Jesus returns. Will it happen today? I don't know. Kind of hope so. It'd be fun. I'm looking forward to that. Because I know my place in heaven is secure. So I'm looking forward to seeing that Savior that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt loves me and wants to spend that time walking in the garden with me. Looking forward to that. Now, at the same time, there are people around me that don't know that. And he's holding off a little bit because there's hearts and lives that he wants to touch and change. And we'll get to that as we go later in this passage. But people making fun of this, saying... You know, you're believing all that hogwash. They will try to ridicule it to say that, you know, nothing has ever changed. But we're going to take a look at a different passage that says 
similar but different. This is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is written by the Apostle Paul to the church. And he says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how will we, we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those that say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they have claimed to have had a spiritual vision or revelation or a letter supposedly from us. So Paul is talking about the opposite situation where people say, oh, things are already unfolding. We've got a new kingdom and God is doing things differently. And if you were really spiritual, you'd realize this. Um, it goes on that there's been a number of times, um, even in my lifetime, where people have come along and said that they have had a special revelation from God and that there's a select few people that have the best relationship with him, you need to join in with them, or you're going to be left out. Um, there is a lot of false teaching out there. We need discernment. We need to know the truth. One infallible reference point. Does it line up with what's in this word, in this Bible? I mentioned those words in red. One of the most powerful verses for me is John chapter 10, verse 35, where Jesus said, Scripture cannot be broken. He's saying that every single word in here is true, will always be true. It, and uh, when I read that the first time, I said, I'm going to believe everything that it says here until somebody proves differently. Well, that decision was made back in 1989. And so in the last 32 years, not one single person has ever proved anything in this wrong to, to me. Therefore, I am forced to continue to believe every single thing it says as true. But I like how the Lord chose. He limited himself in one sense that fulfilling every single thing that's said within Scripture. And I love the majesty of uh, the G or where Jesus lived because there are different individual prophecies that were made regarding him, one of which that he would be born in the town of Bethlehem, Another saying that he would be called a Nazarene, that he was going to be living in the city of Nazareth um, and uh, in the Galilee of the Gentiles. And there's another, what I would consider an obscure verse, which says, and out of Egypt I will call my son, or I have called my son. It's like all of these different things woven together in one life, that Jesus was indeed born in uh, Bethlehem. His parents moved with him to the uh, land of Egypt for a season. And then following that, they returned to Nazareth. They fulfilled what Scripture foretold. And there's just so many different things that are woven together. There is, um, this continues to be a book that inspires me, that surprises me, that delights me, because the Lord, in His wisdom, has put so much in here. He's put His heart. And there's a consistent heart throughout that our Lord is a Redeemer. He loves us. He created us for a reason and for a purpose. I'm going to go on further a little bit. Uh, the second Peter verses, uh, or three verse, uh, verses 5 through 7 of this passage. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. God is love. He is holy and can't tolerate our sin. We need to understand that there is such a thing as judgment. He gave evidence of this in the days of Noah where he did use water as a destructive force. And that's one of the things that Peter makes uh, use of here is that water can be very inspir inspiring. It can be a source of peace if you go out to, uh, to go out to a beach and hang out there and listen to the waves rolling in one after another. The repetition of it is peaceful. It's relaxing. It's comforting. When waves roar and create those big, uh, um, big breakers and so forth, it can be noisy and loud. One of the experiences we had, uh, Amy and I, back in May, we went with my folks to uh, Niagara Falls. And at the base of the waterfall, you're in a boat, and you're getting sprayed by this. But that water falling created its own noise and its own wind. There was a roar and a power to 
that to that that was really humbling. There is power in that water too. And we've come to understand very clearly that with water there is life. Nothing, where water flows, things grow. We need it for, the, for our life itself. So the water itself is neutral. The God behind it is powerful. It's a sign of his love. And he has used water for his purposes, as it shows here. Um, but he, he does reserve the right to judge. He doesn't judge unfairly. The Lord has never once been unfair. He's full of mercy and kindness to those that are willing to receive it. But he does have authority over all things. But I also notice in uh, verse 5 where the phrase, they deliberately forget. We are created with the ability to forget things. I, I don't know about you guys, but I really don't remember much of what, went on, what happened when I was two years old. Um, I'm sure I was a perfect angel at every single moment. And it, because of my advanced age, all those witnesses that know otherwise are, you know, they're not around anymore, so... You have to accept my word for it. Um, we do have the ability to forget. Um, I know that I went through a season in my life where there were some challenges. And the cool thing is I look back and it's like, how did I get through all that? I really don't remember some of the struggles. You know, it's like I have conveniently forgotten some things that were kind of hard so that I can focus on what's good and what's still ahead. It's not, you know, I can remember snippets, but the pain, all of that has faded away. It's just the mercy and the grace of our living God. And there's a quote that I came across, one of the most uh, beautiful ones for me. It's about Clara Barton, who was the lady that founded the Red Cross. It says that once when Mrs. Barton was reminded of a vicious deed that someone had done to her years before, she acted as if she had never even heard of the incident. And uh, the friend said, don't you remember it? Her friend asked. No, came uh, Clara Barton's reply, I distinctly remember forgetting that. We can choose through the grace of God to forgive. We can choose to allow him to cleanse our minds of the pain. You know, we can't get through life it doesn't, well, perhaps you have, I haven't gotten through life without some things that have happened that are wrong. There have been injustices, there have been circumstances that I just Looking after the outside, nope, I was treated wrongly there. I got hurt. But I can deliberately, by allowing God to cleanse and recreate my mind, recreate my attitude, rebuild those forgivenesses to be restored. So that those things don't have to determine my future. As I've heard it said, the past has no future. I'm going to share something, though, from the future. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. I like, the, again, the cons to me, I see a consistency with what Peter shares, what Paul shares, and now what the Apostle John shares. In the John, uh, Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I see in this restoration that is worthy of being looked forward to. And one thing that is made very clear throughout the book of Revelation is that we are the bride of Christ. I know that there was a day when I stood in front of friends and family in church, waiting in anticipation for Amy to walk up that aisle. I was receiving the heart and the, the trust of someone else. And that was the greatest gift that I could ever receive. I was receiving a bride, a gift from Almighty God. But what did uh, she do? Well, she did like most brides do. She spent time getting her dress just right, her hair, makeup just right, everything just right, to be at her absolute best for that moment. I know that I'm not worthy of that, but that's what she chose to do. That's what God wants us to do, to prepare ourselves. We are the bride of Christ. We should prepare our every one of our uh, relationships in our life as much as possible as with, within us to make them right, to restore them, 
to as much as possible lay aside things that are behaviors or that are just not working for us because we all have weaknesses and limitations. We get frustrated or irritable when we shouldn't. We get tempted to, you know, dabble in things. Some of them are directly sinful, and some of them are just a waste of time. You know, um, Candy Crush might fall into that category. I don't, you know. I managed to avoid that one personally, but, you know, I'm just, it's not directly necessarily sin, but is it keeping us from being our very best? Each one of us put together a little bit differently. We can seek God, make ourselves the very best that we can be, we want to be that radiant bride because our Lord is coming back for us. We want to be ready. Now I'm going to go back to what Peter said in verses 8 through 10. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. You see, again, this one thing, this one more thing, and one more thing. Oh, You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will, be, will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. Again, a lot about judgment there. But it starts with making the comparison with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. We're also told that our Lord is as sovereign over all things. He owns everything. So I heard a story about a young man that uh, got inspired. It's like, you know, he started praying and saying, Okay, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. How about just giving me a few hills worth of cattle and make me enormously wealthy? And the Lord said, because you've asked so nicely, I'm going to do that for you. And the young man said, well, how soon, Lord? He said, well, in a few seconds, which is going to turn out to be a thousand years. You've got to wait for it. Okay, I didn't tell that that well. Sorry, that didn't, yeah, that didn't come out right. um, So, um, one thing I have come to understand as a principle is that though I get anxious, I want guaranteed in hand that I know that this is going to happen when it's going to happen. I often have said that I am a very patient person, provided that I know exactly how long I have to wait. Um, it's just, you know, and uh, I want to control my variables. I want to know, you know, just an, I want to anticipate. Um, the Lord is never in a hurry. I've uh, seen many times, many circumstances. In fact, the way we got here, one of the things that God did when we were moving out to this uh, town is I had prayed on a Friday saying, Lord, just not everything is falling into place about moving out here. I need an answer from you within the week. Need something figured out where to live because this just isn't falling into place. That was on a Friday. All the way through Wednesday, absolute silence. There is just, everything looks the same. Not finding any place to look at or anything like that. Day six of that week, I get a call from Heidi Steele, our realtor, saying, hey, John, they've got a great house for you. And we are living there today. It was the blessing of the Lord. He made it with a day to spare. Because so that call came on Thursday. Saturday, we visited the home, put an offer in it. And within days, we were in escrow. But he had an answer. I don't know how long in advance, because I sure didn't know. But when it came down to it, and needed an answer, he was on time. I've come to understand that God is rarely early with my needs, but always right on time. Doesn't work always according to my schedule, but he's never in a hurry. And what he did is he used that to strengthen my heart to increase my trust and reliance upon him because there was nothing I could do to change that circumstance until he opened the door. Waiting on God is not always easy, but it is always worthwhile. Um, 
Now, going on to the thought, he says that, I, that the Lord is being patient with you for your sake. Doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The Lord doesn't, get, doesn't promise to forgive every one of their sins. There's a requirement. You just turn to him and ask for it. Then it's free. It's open to everyone. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Every single one. It's available to everybody, even if you've been a really bad person. There is no sin that he cannot and will not forgive. The only limitation is us turning to him to ask for it. It's freely available. It's a gift from his open hands to us. Not everyone is going to choose to receive that. That's a very sad reality. But it says there that he's being patient with us. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't happened yet. But one of the things is that he has a lot of people that he wants to have the opportunity to repent. But he's not being patient here, it says, with the sinners, those that are outside the kingdom. He's being patient with us. We, the Christians, the people of the living God. He says he's being patient with us. The reason is, is that the people that need to receive Jesus, they need to hear, and they need to hear it through us. They need us to share with them and the opportunity, the forgiveness, the grace, the healing, the love the Savior has for them. They need to hear it from us. We need to do our part. Um, and we don't have to impress them with deep theology. What does he say? He wants us to share the word of our testimony. We talk about the times that God has come through for us. Um, we talk about the good things he has done in our life. What do I believe? What have I seen him do in my life? Because those are things that cannot be disputed by anybody else. When I say that I believe he answers prayer, you can't argue with that. When I say that he has forgiven me and I feel blessed in my heart, you can't argue that. When I say that I have joy in my heart and I've been changed, you can't argue that. I share what God has done in my heart with the people around me. Do they always receive it? No. Do they sometimes ridicule it and make fun of it? Yes. But my job is to do my part and allow him to do his. I mentioned that uh, there is a consistency in Scripture. And one other thought that comes powerfully to my mind this morning is that God is a restorer. He brings, makes old things new. You know, I love, uh, our friend Dave Van Dyke has some amazing older vehicles that have been restored and made new. That's gorgeous. Um, that's a lot of fun because we all can admire that. You know, um, but God does that with us, with our hearts, with our relationships. He restores them. And uh, I had the great privilege this week of spending a lot of time with my dad. And I can tell you without any pride that there was a season in my life where the relationship there wasn't really good. We're going back like 20 years ago or so, but um, we just, we, we disagreed on some things. We didn't talk much. And the cool thing I talked about deliberately forgetting is that I really don't remember a lot of the details of that season, not because I'm too old to remember, but because we have moved past it to such a great degree. We have had that relationship. When I, I remember a time of praying, saying, okay, God, remake this relationship. Help me to do my part to restore this. And I frequently now get words that growing up as a kid I didn't receive, which was, I love you. You know, hearing that my dad loves me and is proud of me is priceless. The greatest gifts that he could give to me. I'm very thankful for and appreciate that relationship today. God restored that because of his heart. He loves me enough that he wanted to restore that, and I am so very deeply thankful. Yes, it took uh, changes on my dad's part too. It's a two-way street. But it's such a great blessing. God is a restorer. It's his very heart. And I believe our worship team is going to come up to share a closing song. But as we do so, um, I'm going to give an opportunity. I'm going to ask you to, uh, for those that are not trying to walk up here, because if you're walking up here, please pay attention to where you're going. Aren't you part of the worship team, ma'am? 
You're allowed to have your eyes open and, you know, and see where you're going safely. Maybe I should have told them this in advance of what I was thinking so that they knew and uh, could um, play along. Now, for those of us that are, well, now they're in position, but I would ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. And uh, is there a, a relationship in your life that has been fractured that you would like to see restored? God can do that. It may take changes on your part, on the other person's part, but as it unfolds, you'll see the beauty and the handiwork of God in that. If you have a relationship, now for those of you that are online watching, you don't need to raise your hand because I won't be able to see it anyway. But for those that are here, if there's a relationship that comes to mind, it's like I really want God to transform that. I would ask you to join with me in raising your hand. Heavenly Father, you are the restorer of all things. You make all things new. Lord, I ask that you would work in the hearts and the lives of my friends to do their part in surrendering it to you, Lord, and allowing you to do the work of recreating. You are a creative genius, sovereign over all things, including our most important relationships, Lord. Do a work of transformation, of restoration, of wholeness, Lord, and make these relationships to be a source of delight and thrill, Lord, to see what good things you have done, and do it all for the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, I'd like to ask you to join us in this. If you could stand and uh, do this last song with us. We have nothing to fear by following wherever God wants to.
church a blessing for you today as you go. May the Lord show you kindness. May the Lord grant each of you His rest. May those who dwell in your house be blessed, and may they never, may they ever be praising the Lord. Church, today I bless you as you go in fellowship with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'd invite you, if you need prayer this morning, you can go to the front. John and Amy will be there to pray with you and for you. Otherwise, have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday. She no longer has a place to hide.